Happy Returns by Too Much Plur. Read by Mika. Breakfast is nothing remarkable. The Hogwarts house elves have mostly given up, enticing Draco into eating like he's still a student himself. Draco helps himself to a hard-boiled egg, a slice of wholemeal toast with marmalade, his one concession to his ever-young sweet tooth, and enough tea to pry his eyelids open. He's got the firsties in an hour, and it doesn't do to be sleepy or dozy when someone's apt to light their feather on fire. Two places down from Draco, Potter doesn't seem to have cottoned on to the fact that they are indeed middle-aged. He's cutting into a tall stack of French toast, oozing with butter and syrup, every bit as angular and contained as he's ever been. Maybe the saviour is exempted from Poppy's annual lectures on nutrition. Draco, however, is forty-four. Forty-four! Four times the age of his first years. Poppy says his family's medical history is rife with examples of poor nutrition, leading to poor magical disease resistance. Poor magical disease resistance. As if a dearth of fresh carrots was the thing that carried off Lucius in the end, not his post-war liquid diet of premium fire whiskey. Still, Draco plucks a banana from the fruit bowl as he leaves the table to head to his classroom, jamming it into the pocket of his robes. He bumps into the back of Potter's neck as he squeezes past him. This provokes Potter to lean around and lift an eyebrow at him. He says, Is that a banana in your pocket, or are you just happy to see me? And Draco says, washbishly, Of course it's a banana. What are you on about? Potter winks at him with inexplicable good humour, and Draco stalks off hastily to grill eleven-year-olds on Wingardium Leviosa. His cheeks fill hard. Surely forty-four is too old to blush this easily. Draco's second class of the day is his new level charms cohort, and this year's bunch are an amiable and enthusiastic lot. They're not as lively as usual, fixed as they are on their upcoming exam, but it's pleasant to see them working quietly on their term capstone projects, laughing now and then when someone's pineapple tap dances off a desk, or someone else glamours their classmates' eyelashes to be a few feet long. The nice thing about a newt class is that they've mostly worked out how to fix their own mistakes. Draco barely has time to notice what's caused all the commotion before one of the other students, Hugo Granger Weasley, this time, has reversed the mistake. Draco is particularly fond of the younger Granger Weasley, actually. He's got all of his mother's intellect and none of her obnoxious need to be the cleverest in the room. His sister Rose was the head girl in her final year, but Hugo wasn't similarly honoured with the title of head boy this year. Draco actually advocated for him to get the title last spring when it was decided, but Sinastra went with a Ravenclaw instead. Still, Hugo is a natural leader, good-natured and calm. He's the captain of the Gryffindor Quidditch team, president of the chess club, and a shoe-in for a place on the curse-breaking course he's applying to for his post-Hogwarts training. Yes, says Draco, a little abruptly, when he notices Granger Weasley lingering in front of his desk after the class is dismissed. Draco has a horror of favouritism, having been its beneficiary for much of his potion training at Hogwarts. He's always careful to not let students know when he likes them best of their class. Uh, says Granger Weasley, and he puts a teapot down on a clear spot of the desktop. A happy birthday, Professor. Draco eyes the teapot. He's never seen any sign that Hugo Granger Weasley takes after his father and uncles, when it comes to practical jokes, but it pays to be cautious with any Weasley, he's learned. It's got a keep hot charm on it, says Hugo, stuffing his hands in his pockets, looking a little embarrassed suddenly. And a perfect steep, because you always make a face when your tea is cold, or 
gets bitter from steeping too long. He lifts a shoulder. You can get something better in Diagon Alley, I'm sure. <laughs> Never mind. It's stupid. He reaches out, as if to take the teapot back. Ah, oh, says Draco, raising his hand in a gesture to stop Granger Weasley from retrieving the teapot. I don't. Did you... You make this, for me. Yes, says Hugo, hoisting the strap on his book bag a little, flattening it over his chest. Just... You're one of the top teachers, I reckon. I... I just wanted to let you know. We all think you're tops. At teaching, that is. Thank you, says Draco, still torn between suspicion and appreciation. Well, away with you. You'll be late to lunch. Granger Weasley's nearly at the door when it occurs to Draco to ask. Wait, who told you? He barks, making the boy halt in his retreat and look around at Draco. All surprise. About my birthday. Uh, says Hugo, palming the back of his neck. Uncle Harry, I mean Professor Potter. It's news to Draco that Harry Potter knows his birthday, though he tries not to show his surprise. Ah, oh, he says, nodding. Carry on. Hugo blushes even more spectacularly than Draco, it seems. His neck is as red as a strawberry as he ducks out of the classroom door. Probably, the boy doesn't like to remind anyone of his own connection to Professor Potter, just as Draco hated when people knew Snape was his godfather. All things considered, Draco actually rather dislikes the timing of his birthday. The start of June is a busy, clamouring time for the whole school. Summer has finally begun to get a foothold in the Highlands, but the weather always feels wasted on Draco, who is forced to spend every evening and weekend hurrying to catch up on his marking, trying to grade late assignments, holding office hours for his owl and Ute students as they start to collectively panic about exams. Not that Draco feels entitled to any fuss, of course, but even if he did, he feels he'd be unlikely to get it. There's always an owl from his mother, naturally, but it comes winging in three or four days early in recent years. He's told her that it doesn't take more than a day for Post to arrive from France these days, but he can't convince her of the fact any more than he can persuade her that it's not necessary to shout down the flu for a long-distance connection anymore. As for his colleagues... Minerva wasn't one to make much of a staff birthday, and Sinastro has followed in her sternly pragmatic footsteps. There will be no fairy cakes in the staff room, or singing of any hideous birthday songs, or crepe paper streamers spurting out of one tips like colourful paper ejaculations. Thank Merlin, honestly. If everyone could please, says Sinastro, clapping her hands lightly, trying to get the attention of the gathered staff. It's the weekly Wednesday's teacher meeting, and it's even rowdier than usual, with everyone overworked and eager for the summer halls. Draco uncrosses his legs, and recrosses them the other way, clearing his throat and throwing a pointed look at Longbottom and Potter. They both smell of earth and fresh air, the pair of them with heads bowed close together, the two outdoor subject teachers. They look vital and windblown, and Draco is heartily jealous. Potter seems to sense Draco's gaze on him, which is a special talent he's long possessed if Draco reflects on it and looks up. He doesn't stop talking, but he locks his eyes on Draco as he continues. His words are inaudible from across the staff room, but his green eyes are... His eyes are fine, 
normal green eyes. Draco looks away and heaves a sigh, looking pointedly at his watch. His fourth-year essays on Clovaria aren't going to mark themselves. Well, strictly speaking, they will. Draco devised his own charm for exactly this in his second year of teaching, but he still has to go over the marks afterwards and make sure they're accurate. Good afternoon, Sinistra tries again, raising her voice a little more, clapping a little louder. Gradually, the conversations quieten, and the other teachers come to attention. Thank you, says Sinistra, in her low, calm way, and waves her hand to send a copies of their meeting agenda out to each of them. Let's begin. Staff meetings are hardly thrilling affairs, but Draco generally does enjoy the collegiality that comes from shared moaning over the most trying students, and sharing mirth over the funniest stories of the week. Draco has been at Hogwarts for nearly fifteen years now, and he still occasionally boggles to think that these meetings happened weekly when he was a student himself. He had no idea back then how thoroughly the teachers paid attention to the lives of their pupils, their little sorrows, their struggles, their quirks and idiosyncrasies. Today, there's a weird shared moment of regret when someone mentions that one of their top six-year girls has thrown over a seventh-year girl who has never been more than a middling student. Oh, that hero was so good for Bess, says Penelope Clearwater, who teaches arithmetic and is still a bit of a swat. Bess was good for a hero, opines Longbottom. Marlin, it was nice to see that kid outside once in a while, touching grass. Oh, to be young, says Harry, and to feel love's keen sting. Potter is actually the biggest bloody weirdo going, which is saying something if one truly surveys this room of weirdos that compromise the faculty of Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. The meeting eventually wraps up, albeit far later than Draco hoped. And finally, everyone stood up and milling around, and Draco goes to make a strategic retreat. He's got a bottle of very nice elf-made wine in his rooms, and while he'd never indulge in a weeknight ordinarily, all too aware of the path his father stumbled down, Draco thinks he's allowed this little private pleasure on the occasion. But before Draco can exit the room, he finds his way blocked by Potter, who literally dives through bins, weirdo, to manage this manoeuvre. Three broomsticks, says Potter, pushing his glasses up to his nose. This close to, Draco can see the fine lines in the outside corners of Potter's green eyes, the silver crowding his temples. It's so bloody weird how they're all ageing. What about it? Draco says warily. It might be another of Potter's baffling non sequiturs, like the banana comment this morning, or the weird thing about love's sting moments earlier. Uh, says Potter. Shall we? Draco's heart gives an anxious thump and leans into his throat, rabbiting away abruptly. What? He said, sure he's misunderstood, because Potter is truly a weirdo. It's your birthday, says Potter. So, by your pint. He pushes his glasses up his nose, and shoots a little glance to his left, while Longbottom is lingering, rather transparently pretending to read the corkboard notice board that no one ever reads or uses. Last time Draco bothered looking at it, it still boasted a roster of night patrol shifts for the Basilisk petrification fiasco, dated circa 1993. Well, says Draco, not really sure if he wants to endure the whole evening of pretending to be chums with Neville Longbottom. 
Potter, I don't know if... Come on, says Potter, and smiles his slow, crooked smile. All green eyes and windswept dark curls and angular boy saviour charm. Draco feels his knees going just a touch weak, and is instantly horrified with himself. He thought himself well over this. I... He says, helpless. One pint, says Potter. I'll have you back safe before ten. I, Draco thinks widely. Not we. Uh, yes, all, all right, he says. Trying to sound reluctant and put upon, and not at all like someone who's a bit winded at the thought of Harry Potter asking him down to the pub for a pint on his birthday. One pint. Longbottom makes a noise, like he's found some useful information contained in the Yellow Prophet article clipped headlined, Incoming Muggle PM Thatcher Refuses Meeting with Minister for Magic. Good night, Harry, he says, jamming his hands into his robe pockets, smiling mildly at them. Good night, Draco. He slopes away, all tall awkwardness and rounded broad shoulders and smashing jawline. The classic long-bottom cocktail of hopeless nerd and oblivious snack. Do you need to pop into your rooms, or... Says Potter at the same moment, Draco says, Shall we go from here? Potter laughs, and Draco snaps his mouth shut. And there's a moment of weird waiting before Potter tries again. Let's go, then. Sure, yes, says Draco. And they bump elbows as they go through the doorway. Sorry and pardon me. And then they're walking together through the castle on Draco's 44th birthday. Apparently off to have a pint together in Hogsmeade. Draco is barely ten feet out the castle gates, before he knows this was a horrible decision. It's clear they've nothing to talk about, nothing in common other than awful shared history, and Draco has somehow agreed to endure awkward, stilted conversation and long, horrible silences for an hour or more. But Potter takes a deep breath and blows it out and takes his chin up at a small speck in the sky ahead. That'll be Henry Singh, I imagine. Draco squints, making out the distant figure zipping across the streaky grey summer sky. Must be, he says. Did I hear that he's already got an offer from the magpies? He did, Potter confirms. Starting position. Never seen a seeker like him, have you? Just one, says Draco automatically, then clears his throat. I meant me, of course. <laughs> right, says Potter, chuckling. Anyway, I don't blame him skipping off his newt revision at this juncture. No, agrees Draco. He considers and discards the notion of mentioning that Singh was a bit of dunce in charms, and got a rare tea on his owl examination two years ago. Instead, he watches as the boy drops into a corkscrew dive, and then swoops up into a heart-stopping twist. Whoa, is what Draco winds up saying. His body remembers that feeling, even if it's been a good decade since he was stupid enough to attempt anything like it. My thoughts exactly, says Potter, also checking his step to admire the manoeuvre. Just another Wednesday night for him, though, huh? Draco bites back the observation that wants to escape him, that youth is wasted on the young, because he's only forty-four, not one hundred and four. 
But as they start walking again, Draco's left knee twinges, and his shoulders resume their chronic ache from too many hours hunched over parchment. He can't help pondering how bloody old he is from the viewpoint of being seventeen, and at the beginning of everything. Draco himself is firmly in the middle, no matter how he slices it, and it's the middle of, well, nothing much, really. A long, uneventful career as a reluctant educator. An unremarkable full stop at the end of a blood-splattered line of self-important bigots. Not a family man, nor one with any admirable legacy to pass along anyway. And yet, Draco could have made a much worse mess of things. After all, here he is walking to Hogsmeade with Harry Potter, of all people. Harry Potter, who also inexplicably is wound up alone, and without the parcel of ginger children the world expected for him. Harry Potter, colleague and erstwhile nemesis and current noted weirdo. The silences abruptly become comfortable, Draco realises. Did I hear someone say that you're off to Uganda this summer, Potter says. After another few minutes of surprisingly companionable walking. Oh, says Draco, who would have never guessed Potter knew anything about his plans. Well, yes, actually. I've never been, says Potter, looking up at Wigan trees as they pass by it idly observing the lace wigs hovering around it. Will it be your first visit? No, says Draco, then forces himself to elaborate even as he wonders why Potter should care. No, I'm completing a postgraduate mastery, actually. This will be my second last summer of studies. In charms? Harry asks, kicking a pebble down the path tucking his hands into his robe's pocket. No, says Draco. Not charms. He can feel Potter's curious gaze on him now. A sensation he's endured consistently for more than thirty years, but not one that's got more comfortable with the passage of time. What? began Potter. But Draco cuts him off, not wanting to drag this thing out now that they've started this conversation digression. I'm studying magical archival restoration and conservation, Draco says. Knowing it sounds horribly boring, hoping that we'll put an end to it. Do you mean taking care of old books? Like Madame Pence? Potter asks, because of course he won't let it go. No, Draco says, not really sure how much he really wants to explain himself. Well, maybe a bit, but it's not only books. Potter's silence is expectant. All sorts, really, Draco says. Books, artifacts, devices, we even preserve spells, like incantations. Audio archives and photography and... All, all sorts. Last summer I helped with restoring what might have been Mokoma's Iron Hammer. Like, I got to touch it with my own hands. He holds his hands up and looks at them in the slanting light of the summer evening. Well, I had gloves on, but... New Endo. Can you imagine? I'm not sure you need reminding how shit I was at history, Potter says wryly. I have no idea what you're talking about. Draco waves this away. I don't think Binns is too keen on teaching African history. A seen a magical object wouldn't rate his attention. Too interesting, Potter says, laughing lightly. Not wide enough, I'd wager, says Draco. And Potter's laugh grows 
into a surprised chuckle at this. I think I heard him telling the second years that the sun never sets on the British Empire last week. Potter grins, amused. Tell me about this special hammer, then. Is it like Mjolnir? Draco's eyes prop up with surprise to hear Potter referencing Norse mythology. Not exactly, he says. You know about Mjolnir? I'm an avid fan of Christopher Hemsworth, says Potter. Is he some sort of Norse magical history scholar? Draco asks. Potter snorts. No, but he's tall and blonde and fit. He cuts a glance Draco's way, and doesn't bother hiding the way he scans up and down Draco's own tall, blonde self. He's a Mughal actor. Oh, says Draco, not quite getting it, fighting yet another horrid blush. Potter doesn't mean, well, he's teasing, of course. He plays Thor in the films. Right, says Draco. The films. He takes a steadying breath and plunges into something that feels quite a lot less dangerous. So, Makoma was born carrying an iron hammer. His poor mom, says Potter. <laughs> quite, says Draco. He performed feats of great strength at a young age and astonished everyone left and right, besting dragons and winning contests and so forth. Not all is cracked up to be, Potter opines, but go on. Draco laughs in spite of himself, and goes on at some length. The stories are varied, and the muggle versions are nearly as good as the wizarding ones. Potter is a surprisingly attentive listener, gasping at the right moments, laughing, nodding with approbation. The stories carry them right into Hogsmeade, and up against the bar of the three broomsticks. Hannah Abbott looks unsurprised to see them together, and Draco breaks off in the middle of a sentence as he remembers that she's taken up with Longbottom. "'You were saying,' says Potter, paying for their pines." About a five-headed giant. Uh, says Draco, blinking rapidly, remembering. Uh, yes, so Makoma realized straight away that there will be no taming of this bastard. What he does is... And Draco carries on as Potter leads the way to a table in the corner. The three broomsticks is quiet. A typical Hogsmeade Wednesday, but Draco still clocks the little double-takes, as patrons first recognize Harry, and then Draco. Hannah bings over their pint glasses, just as Draco finishes the final tale, and Potter utters a frustrated little sigh at his conclusion. Not to your liking? Draco asks. He's always found it pleasing that Makama came to such a peaceful end after his life of fighting going up into the Sky Realm with the Great Spirit alongside his final, undefeated foe. Well, why couldn't he have just retired from being a hero and had a bit of quiet? Harry says. I reckon he earned it. Maybe that's what the story actually means, Draco says. Maybe he actually slipped away and became the Care of Magical Creatures professor at Ugando and took up residence in a little hut on the grounds, and spends all of his days playing in the woods and chatting with centaurs. Potter laughs good-naturedly enough at this, and concedes the point. Maybe he did, he says, then lifts his glass. Happy birthday, Draco. Cheers, says Draco confusedly thrown by Potter, by Harry, calling him Draco. Has he done that before? He must have done, 
and Draco didn't notice. Only, it feels so new. They each take a sip, and Draco turns his pipe on his beer mat, watching the foam of the lip of the glass slip slowly down into the beer. His heart is back in his throat, thudding away. None of this makes any sense. Potter doesn't make any sense. Are you going to leave us once you have done your mastery, then? Potter asks. Move on from teaching and become a famous conservator? No, says Draco immediately. It's just something I enjoy. A hobby. Teaching is... It's what I want to do, honestly. Me too, says Harry. Funny that. How we both ended up back here. Hmm, says Draco. Well, what about you? Any travel plans for your summer? Potter does have travel plans, it turns out. He explains them in typical Potterish form, matter of fact and brief. He's got three weeks in Southeast Asia, adventuring alone, and then a further week in the south of France with the Granger Weasleys, and finally some camping in the Cotswolds with Teddy Lupin and his serious longtime girlfriend. Persephone, isn't it? Draco says, vaguely remembering a chat with the girl at a drummer's Easter dinner party a couple months back. She's a lively, dark-haired thing, quick to laughter, amiable and sweet. She seems a good match for him, I suppose. Have you noticed how all the quiet people always seem to wind up with someone who does all the talking for both of them? Hmm, says Harry, eyes sparkling just a little. Yeah, I have. He glances up at Draco. Green eyes, dark lashes. You've been to Thailand before, haven't you? Any tips for me? Draco does have some tips, and he chats through his first pint and into a second, that Hannah brings over without Potter seeming to ask for it. It's not until a third pint shows up that Draco realizes he's possibly a bit in his cups, unintentionally. I think I'm a lightweight these days, Draco says, head spinning a bit. Marlon, am I talking too much? Not at all, says Harry, who has firmly become Harry, not Potter, over the course of the second pint. I like hearing you talk. Sometimes I stand outside the charms classroom and listen to your lectures. He blinks. God, I think I'm a bit drunk too. I did not mean to say that out loud. You listen to my lectures, Draco says, blinking. He must have misheard. Uh, no, of course I don't. That sounds like something a mad obsessive would do, says Harry reassuringly. It's not like I'm a weirdo. You are a bit, says Draco. To his consternation, he sounds extremely fond. I suppose I am, Harry says, looking down at his pint, then up at Draco with his bright eyes all light. About some things, anyway. He drums his fingers on the tabletop. Get any good presents? He goes on with a slightly forced voice of cheer and friendliness. No, says Draco. Oh, well... A charmed teapot from the younger Granger Weasley. It might have been a bit bootlicking, honestly, though he doesn't seem like the type. More of a tilf tribute, I reckon, says Harry, swigging more of his beer and hiding a grin as he does. Perils of teaching teenagers. What are you on about? Draco says, baffled. 
What a tilth. Marlin, says Harry. You really don't know. Should I know? Draco asks. What? Is it some new variety of horrible prank? I haven't tried the teapot yet. Should I bin it directly when I get back? Harry laughs, low and sweet. Draco, he says. The kid has a crush on you. He what? Draco squawks, almost knocking over his pint in his shock. Hugo fancies you, says Harry, laughing more. Don't tell me you haven't noticed. Draco gapes at Harry. He's seventeen, he says outraged. I didn't say you should fancy him back, Harry says, chortling now. Merlin, you should hear him go on about you. Ron was ready to voluntarily deafen himself at Christmas. It was just a steady stream of how brilliant Professor Malfoy is, how funny, how clever, and how good he looks in his black teaching robes, too. Well, says Draco, at a loss for words. I certainly didn't encourage him. Of course you didn't, says Harry, shaking his head. Anyway, I can't blame him. It's a rite of passage, isn't it? Thinking your teacher is fit. I... says Draco, still working through the shock of it. He wants to deny what Harry's saying, but suddenly he's remembering Gildor Lockhart in second year, and Remus Lupin in third, and Merlin, Draco's brief, powerful, and highly confusing crush on Professor Babbling in his fifth year which fully had him believing he could be straight for the right woman. But me, he says, finally, blinking fast. Yes, you, you complete tosser, says Harry. Shall we have some chips? Let's have some chips. It'll sop up some of the beer. He flags down Hannah Abbott from across the pub and mimes eating a chip. Something Draco can't unsee that, and then he turns his attention back to Draco. Listen, you're young by Hogwarts teacher's standards. You dress well. You're good at challenging your students without being an asshole about it. You're fair. You're funny. Stay on, Potter. We all know you're the most fanciful teacher at Hogwarts. Draco breaks in, trying to prevent further blushing, because he had no idea Potter thought any of this. It's all a bit much. Am I? Harry says, arching an eyebrow. Not sure that's accurate. Well, says Draco, I suppose Longbottom has his charms. The statement unfortunately coincides with Hannah bringing up a plate of chips, and Draco has to hastily decide whether to pretend he's being funny or admit to having a latent attraction to the herbology professor and lumpy wool cardigans and dirt permanently under his fingernails. He tries a weak smile, opting for the former, but not quite managing it. Neville's taken, says Hannah tartly, but she winks at Draco. Don't be greedy, you have plenty for yourself, she says, and swishes away before Draco can wonder aloud why'd you think him greedy? when he hasn't taken a single chip yet, and Potter's got three in one hand, half eaten. Mm, says Potter, mouth full, mannerless as ever. God, the chips here are so much better since you took over. Well in love, Hannah Abbott. Draco takes a chip and samples it, and can't fault Harry's opinion. The chip is crunchy, and salty, and piping hot on the inside. All smooth white potato, without any mealiness at all. There are little bits of brown potato skin clinging to the side of the chip, and it's wonderfully crispy and papery when Draco bites into it next. Anyways, says Harry, where were we? 
You were being delusional, Draco says. Or maybe you were trying on a little false modesty, which you've always been rubbish at. You should really stop. Harry levels a steady, pleased look at him and says, You've always been excellent at keeping me humble, you kid. Draco stares back at him, probably a bit stupidly, and tries to decide if maybe quite a bit of what he's thought of as Harry's weirdness has actually been, well, something that until earlier this evening felt far less likely. Do you like mayo on your chips? he asks, casting around for a change of subject. We could have more mayo on the chips. Whatever you want, Draco, says Harry. Exactly like he means something else entirely, low and warm and syrupy. Draco eats too many chips with mayo, and gulps through his third pint to wash them down, and the result is that he's half drunk, with greasy, salty fingers in no time flat, and Harry Potter is still absolutely looking at him in a way that Draco can't think of as anything but quite heated. Should we, uh, says Draco, because Harry hasn't touched his pint in minutes. Yeah, says Harry, and throws back the last third of his beer. Long neck, dark prickles of stubble, sharp jawline. Fuck. Yeah, let's head up. The night is finally dimming. Ten o'clock in the highlands on June 5, so... Only the start of sunset, really. But it feels warm and endless, like all summer nights. The streets of Hogsmeade are deserted, which means there's no reason for Harry and Draco to walk close together. But they do anyway. Elbows bump and shoulders, and they don't apologise or move apart now. Draco has a drumming, thrilling feeling in his stomach. A sense of possibility that he hasn't properly felt in years. And it's making him self-conscious and giddy and happy all at once. He's probably being a fool. He's probably got it all wrong. Draco, says Harry. Once they're out of the village and on the lonely darkening path to the castle. Uh, yes, says Draco not looking over, feeling his elbow collide with Harry's again. Stop for a second, says Harry, halting and stepping into Draco's path. Yes, says Draco, just a general yes to everything in this moment. The waning blue summer lights, the shush of the leaves as the wind blows lightly past, the faintly dizzy tipsy feeling in Draco's head, and the sight of Harry Potter in front of him. Harry Potter, with his messy graying hair, and his smudged glasses, and his late-night prickles of beard stubble, and the faint sheen of chip grease over his handsome, expressive lips. Maybe you knew already, says Harry, but maybe you didn't, so I'm going to... I'm just going to say it. Draco, I'm... I'm a bit mad for you. Draco stares. I didn't know, he says. Oh, says Harry. And his green eyes lock onto Draco's own. Well, now you do. There's a moment where Draco is too frozen with shock at the improbability of the moment to react further. And in that moment, he sees Harry shift his weight and break his jaw to stare over Draco's shoulder, the muscle in his jaw flickering faintly. Anyway, Harry says, and utters a little sigh, and makes as though to turn and resume walking. 
But Draco panics. A bolt of, no, don't let it go back to the way it was, streaking through emergently. And he reaches out and gets Harry by the shoulder. Has just enough time to think that Harry is firm and bony and a little shorter than Draco expected him to be, up close like this. And then Harry is smiling, crooked and big, and he's so alight, hopeful. Giddy and anticipatory and maybe a little foolish, too. Draco hasn't done this in a very long time, and it feels so bizarre, actually. To reach out and curl one hand around the side of Harry Potter's neck. To step closer and look at Harry Potter's curving mouth. To duck in and... Kissing is weird. It's a strange thing to put a mouth to another mouth, to press, and it's terribly awkward. It's... And then Harry sighs out quietly through his nose and grabs Draco's waist and opens his mouth just a little, and Draco forgets that any of this is weird in the least, because he's kissing Harry, and Harry tastes of chips and beer, and he smells of earth and growing things. And he's warm and firm and sure as he kisses Draco, as he grips him, as he pulls back and smiles foolishly against Draco's mouth. Really, he says. I didn't know says Draco, and kisses him again. And it's even better now that he knows Harry's mouth a little, the shape of it, the way it moves. Idiot, says Harry. I was so obvious. Can you blame me for... Draco was to stop and kiss the corner of Harry's mouth, the side that goes up a little higher. Why would I think you thought about me like that? But Harry just laughs and kisses the corner of Draco's mouth in answer, then sucks on his lower lip, pulls back and nuzzles back into the side of Draco's neck and... Holy fuck. Sweet Merlin. Draco forgot he could feel this way. He's electric with wanting, not just the animal of wanting of sex and closeness and touch, but the keen hunger of wanting this person, this exact person, their smile and their voice and the slope of their shoulders and the angle of their nose and the tide of their breath. Draco cups the back of Harry's head and lets his fingers plunge into the messy curls there, exhales shakily and moves to make it easier for Harry to kiss his neck. We should, uh, says Draco, who has not had a boner on the path from Hogsmeade in at least twenty-seven years. He hasn't had a boner from something as innocent as a little snogging and even longer, if he's honest, but Harry smells incredible. And he's hard, too, where his hips are snugged up into Draco's. Yeah, says Harry muzzily. His glass is fogged and askew, where he pulls back to regard Draco. Probably. He pulls Draco in, and grinds his cock lazily against Draco's hip. And Draco has a flash of understanding. A banana in my pocket, he says, exhaling with realization. It was a cock joke. Marlin, says Harry. You're such a weirdo, Draco Malfoy. Fuck off, says Draco. Sorry, reflex. Don't fuck off. Harry very much does not fuck off, and they snog for a while longer on the quiet path, the sun setting, the wind blowing gently. Draco wakes to birdsong, and the rattle of kettle on the harp. And when he opens his eyes, it's to the sight of a dozen toothy metal traps dangling from the rafters above him. He stretches, feeling pleasantly sore, and turns his head on his pillow to see Harry Potter, 
making tea, wearing nothing but his pants. I'd better get going, Draco says reluctantly, because he needs fresh robes and a shower and not to walk into the great hall wearing yesterday's clothes. Harry turns to look at Draco over his shoulder, and his hair is even more appalling than usual. He's got a visible love bite on his collarbone. His chest is hairy, and he's got the most perfectly unexpected little belly. He'll be 44 next month, too. Stay a little longer, he says. I'm making toast. I've got marmalade. It's your favourite. One slice, Draco decides. In bed, he adds. Harry smiles, his crooked smile, and arches an eyebrow as Draco tugs the sheets a little lower. Tilf, he says. You already did, Draco points out, because Harry explained the acronym last night, when they were a little punch-drunk and silly, in the brief fallow period between their first rather clumsy and overeager round and their second lengthy, ambitious, athletic, and extremely competently executed round. Yeah, said Harry. I said what I said. 